<laughs> okay. Everyone, so. There's your badge. I'm going to be editing later. <laughs> Welcome. So, Tuesday we discussed the importance of story, right? And we discussed various stories that you yourself could be thinking about and telling. And then you also are going to write up ten, a couple of lines per each event from your life or your parents' life or your friends' lives that you could possibly write short stories or nonfiction or poetry about, okay? And we discussed the poem Oranges and how strongly story oranges is. It's very much a story-based poem, okay? It's much a narrative. There's a little bit of assets alliteration and a little bit of imagination. So there's a little bit of music, three similes. But mostly it's very story-based and it's a really strong poem. Okay, so you can get away with writing a really strong story-based poem and not worry about things over here very much and you'll be writing strong poetry, okay? But if you want to write a really great poem, you'll start learning how to balance. You'll write something that's really strong story but also has some music and imagination. Okay, now if you hate story, we will also talk later about how to write just music and imagination and not write a story, but simply have a very strong sense of place. So tonight for homework, you're going to be reading Mount Pisgah by James Kimbrell. It's on a web page, okay, uh, poemoftheweek.org, I think. So you will read that poem, and I want to ask you to notice that it is not a narrative poem. It sounds like a narrative poem. It sounds like a story poem because it's very clear. There's nothing unclear about it. You know exactly where you are. You're in Mount Pisgah. The title tells you that. First line says, it was the middle of the night. So you know exactly where you are. You're on Mount Pisgah, and it's the middle of the night. Okay, so you're very strongly placed. But the poem is all about music, all about imagination, all about assonance and alliteration. And if you've noticed the last words, they almost rhyme. So you'll be looking for the near rhyme in that poem, okay? So... Today we're going to talk about one more poem that I think is a strong story poem. It's also by Corinne Hales, who wrote Sunday Morning, but I promise there are no dead kittens in this one. <laughs> okay, but it, she starts pushing more toward music in this poem. Okay, so it's Power by Corinne Hales. No one we knew had ever stopped to train before. Hardly daring to breathe, I waited, belly down with my brother in the dry ditch, watching through the green thickness of grass and willows, stuffed with crumpled newspapers. The shirt and pants looked real enough, stretched across the rails. I felt my heart beating against the cool ground, and the terrible, long screech of the trains breaking began. We had done it. Then it was in front of us. A hundred iron wheels tearing like time into red flannel and denim, shredding the child we had made until it, it finally stopped. My brother jabbed at me, pointed down the tracks. A man had climbed out of the engine, was running in our direction, waving his arms, screaming that he would kill us, whoever we are. Then very close to the spot where we hid, he stopped and cursed at the rags and paper scattered over the gravel from our joke. I tried to remember which of us that red shirt had belonged to, but morning seemed too long ago and a man was falling, sobbing to his knees. I couldn't stop watching. My brother lay next to me, his hands covering his ears, his face pressed tight to the ground. Okay, so this is very much a story poem, right? It's telling us an event from her childhood that she remembers. And it was a very powerful event from her childhood. You can tell it's powerful because of the, the fact that at the end, she tries to back away from the story. It's so frightening for her. It's so powerful for her that she tries to ignore the story and talk about something else. Like, who did that red shirt belong to? Which, which is not important, but it's her way of saying, I can't even think about this anymore. And then, of course, the name of the poem is Power. So you know it's a powerful memory. It was a powerful event. And they had done something that no one they knew had done. In fact, the first line gives you a conflict. No one we knew had ever stopped to train before. So there's your conflict. Immediately, as the reader, you're asking yourself, what's going to happen? Are they going to stop a train? How are they going to stop a train? And importantly, is anyone going to get hurt? Okay, or is anyone going to arrest it? It's actually legal to hang out on train tracks. I found out as a child. <laughs> so, um, 
so the, the very first line, you're, you're wondering what happens. You've got a conflict. You want to keep reading to find out what happens. And then you get this powerful story that, that really, I mean, it's heart-wrenching, especially if you use empathy. If you think about it, if you think about it not from the point of view of the child, but from the point of view of the man in the train. And she gives us that point of view, right? When she gives us that man, you know, the man slams on brakes, this long screeching of the train, and light time into red flannel and denim shredding the child, line break. Remember I said Tuesday, think about your line breaks, think about what word you're gonna end your lines on. Okay, so this is a really powerful word to end your line on because for that nanosecond, we actually picture a real child. Okay, so we have this real child lying on the tracks and the train has run over that child and the man who's driving the train, the engineer, believes he has killed a child. And you think about that. Think how powerful that is. I mean, some of us may have killed children. I don't want to bring that up, but, you know, maybe it's like great fear of mine when I'm driving and I have a nephew or niece in the car with me. What if I have a wreck? How do you live with that? Uh, so it's like that. What if, you know, this man's thinking he's killed someone, he jumps out of the train, he's screaming, he's so, so heartbroken, he's so hurt, he's so full of emotion, he drops to his knees sobbing. And think about that. How often do you see grown men drop to their knees and sob? I mean, it's pretty rare, right? So she's really showing you just how powerful of an event this was. So she's got a really strong story. And she does something I want you to, to notice when you're writing to think about this, okay? She gives you information, details, about, for example, how they made the child, but she doesn't give you all the details at once. The, the, the images, the details accumulate through the poem. So at first you have stuffed with crumpled newspapers. The shirt and pants looked real enough stretched across the rails. Okay, so you know that you have certain pants, you know they're stuffed with crumpled newspapers. And then you get three stanzas later, two stanzas later, uh, into the tearing like time into red flannel and denim. So now you have a better picture of the little stuffed child. So now you know it's stuffed with newspapers, you know it's denim, now you know it's red flannel. Okay, so it's more information, but she doesn't give you all that at once. It just slowly accumulates, it comes very naturally. Okay, so there's something to think about when you're writing short stories and poems and nonfiction. Any writing you do, you don't want to overwhelm the reader with all the details at once. You just slowly accumulate them. And when you're doing reading on your own, you'll notice that's what authors do. Okay? But so this was a very powerful story. It was a very clear story, right? This is what I want to impress upon you is that you have stories. Okay, and you need to think about those stories and think about how to tell those stories in a way that's going to interest a reader and keep them reading. Okay, and focus those stories and bring them in and really interest the reader. And then, okay, so you have the really strong story and you can have a really strong story and that's all you need to make a really strong poem. But she also brings in a little bit of music. If you notice at the beginning, hardly daring to breathe, you have the hard B sound. I waited belly down with my brother. So you have B and B again, belly and brother, in the dry ditch. So you have down, dry, ditch. So you have the hard D sounds. So you have three Bs and three Ds in two lines. Right? That's, do you remember which one it is? Alliteration or absence? Alliteration. There you go. The repetition of B sounds. And because they happen very close together, they're very powerful sounding. Okay? So, you have that. And then in the next line that I read, watching through the green thickness of grass and willows. So you have green and grass, and then you have thickness and willows. So you have short eye sound of thickness and willows, and you have the green, the G, R of green and grass. Now here's the thing that you try to remember, if you're writing a poem, and you're writing a story poem, you don't have to put the correct details if it doesn't quite work. It may be that she was watching the train through autumn olive bushes. Okay, autumn olive bushes do not have a short eye sound. So she changed the autumn olive bushes to willows in order to get a short eye sound. You can do things like that. 
So if you have, you know, if you're burning trash in a 50 gallon burn barrel, you can change it to a 55 gallon burn barrel to get the double F sound. So little things like that you can do, okay? To add music to your poems. And that's really easy to do. Trust me, it's really easy, okay? Now the next is stuffed with crumpled newspaper. So you sound, right? Stuffed, crumpled. Um, is there anything else that you guys noticed that was really strong, assonance and alliteration? She pretty much did it in the first two stanzas, then she stopped, right? That's actually really important. Think about this when you're doing your writing, in any writing whatsoever. If you're writing a short story, first page has to be the best page you've ever written. All right? If you're writing a cover letter to get a job, that first paragraph, think about an employer who is reading a thousand applications. They're not going to read everything you wrote. The only way they're going to read everything you wrote is if your first paragraph is so good they want to read the second paragraph. This poem, the first, first stanza was so good we read the second stanza, right? And then we kept reading because the story carried us. Narrative will always carry us. A strong conflict will always carry us. I was just reading a, a braided nonfiction essay by Wendy Rawlings and it begins with, here's the situation, my niece is throwing up and has diarrhea, she ate a salad, it's four o'clock in the morning, she's awake throwing up, her mother's still asleep, it's the day after Christmas. That's not exactly, exactly what it said, but that's pretty much what it said. Okay, I read every word of that essay all the way to the end till I found out her niece survived. Because, right, we care. That's the hook, that's the conflict that gets us in. Okay, so the conflict is no one we ever knew had ever stopped a train before. Does someone get hurt? Do they stop the train? What happens? Okay. The story will carry you. Okay, just remember, it has to be some type of conflict there at the beginning. And then if you give us music, that's going to make so much better poem. Oranges by Gary Soto was such a better poem because he put that final image at the end of the little boy peeling and unpeeling an orange so that it looked like from a distance against the gray backdrop of the December sky that he was building a fire in his hands. That final gorgeous metaphor makes that poem explode off the page. Okay?